Well, I think we can get started here. Okay. And and um, I want to welcome everybody to the uh, webinar. This is for uh, CortiCare staff, and the topic tonight is periodic and rhythmic uh, patterns in ICU EEG. Uh, presenter is Navita Kashal, and uh, just as a quick background, uh, Dr. Kashal uh, got her undergraduate and graduate degrees in India and has worked in several uh, facilities around the United States and um, most recently at Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia, and she has been working with uh, Corticare for how long? Uh, two years now. Two years, and is uh, one of our uh, LTM managers and uh, her continuing education ed educator is her primary role. Um, I want to welcome uh, everyone to the webinar. Uh, it is being recorded and uh, will be available later. Uh, if you're uh, attending and uh, wanting to get asset CEUs after the uh, webinar completes, you'll get an email with a link to the evaluation form that has to be completed and submitted, and then uh, that will be sent into ASSET. Uh, and without any further uh, discussion, I'll give you uh, Dr. Kishal. Good evening, everyone. I'm really glad to be here talking to you about uh, the patterns that we are seeing in our almost everyday professional life uh, while monitoring EEGs. So I'm going to talk about periodic and rhythmic, a little bit of generalized patterns uh, uh, in, in ICU EEG. Now keep in mind, we are not classifying any seizures or epilepsies, uh, not dwelling into what falls, what pattern falls where, we are just talking simple patterns, the morphology of the EEG, the patterns that we are seeing in ICU EEG. So there are some periodic discharges, generalized, lateralized, bilateral, independent, stimulus-induced, and brief ictal rhythmic discharges. There is rhythmic delta activity, which is classified into generalized and lateralized. And then, of course, spike and wave or sharp and wave patterns. Now, here's the first question. Since we are all are monitoring, uh, getting uh, into either in the clinical setting or uh, remotely. So here's the first question. Which pattern do you think is highly associative of seizures or status epilepticus if it is not treated? So there are five options, GRDA, LPDs, lateralized rhythmic delta, the stimulus-induced patterns, or GPDs. Jeff, if you can open the poll, please, for everyone to answer. And we'll give you just about 10 more seconds to make your selection. And it looks like we're almost locked in. And we'll end the poll now. Okay. I'm hoping you can see the results, but if not, I will read them off. GRDA, 11%. LPDs, 15%. SIRPDs, 11%. And GPDs, 61%.
Okay, so 15% of the people are right. LPDs, lateralized periodic discharges, are highly associative of seizures if they are left untreated. And especially if they are uh, in occurrence with uh, modifiers, that means the fast activity and the rhythmic. So LPDs are the one that is that we have to keep our eyes on. So here is uh, a slide that I I always refer to. This tells you on the x-axis associates association with seizures and on the y-axis, the mortality rate of the patients in ICU setting. If you see, LPDs are almost 100%, 60 to 100% associated with occurrence of seizure. They are associated with seizures almost 100%. Right behind them is LRDA. And then, of course, bilateral independent discharges, periodic discharges are competing with LRDA. The mortality rate is quite high in patients with bipedes, bilateral independent periodic discharges. Serpids, less than 50%. So LPDs are the one, the, the savage ones, the bad boys of the epileptic ward are basically LPDs. So these periodic discharges, they were sort of start to make entrance into epilepsy ward sometimes in 1960s, and mostly seen in patients with encephalitis and focal brain lesions. So there is no epilepsy kind of a thing happening there. So focal brain lesions, they are showing these uh, periodic discharges. The universal nomenclature, the terminology for these patterns is given by ACNS. We have the latest one, the 2021 guidelines. Uh, so sometimes in late 1990s and uh, in 2020s, they have started to figure out that these periodic discharges are basically uh, electrographic signature of metabolic crisis or neuronal injury. So it means whatever is happening baseline, the, the, the condition, the clinical condition is, is making these periodic discharges happen. However, we still are not 100% sure, we cannot say that, okay, periodic discharges mean this. We have different researchers, different epileptologists, they say they can be ictal, they can be interictal, or they can be on unstable interictal continuum. It could be a beginning of status epilepticus or maybe end of status epilepticus. So when you, when you go back to the review and the literature, so periodic discharges are basically quite a wide range uh, explanation of patient's clinical state. Now, since we are talking discharges, we should know the difference between burst and a discharge. So a discharge is a waveform which does, should not be having more than three phases. Okay, it can have more than three phases if it is occurring for half a second or less. That is a discharge. Anything longer than half a second, at least having four phases. And less than 30 seconds is a burst. So a discharge is a very small period, less than half a second duration, uh, can be of uh, three phases or maybe more. Uh, so that's a major difference according to the ACNS guidelines, ACNS terminology a big difference between burst and discharge. So when you annotate the EG or put your notes in, make sure that you're using the correct one. The savage of all these patterns, LPDs. We still use term plots and almost 10% of patients in ICU will show this pattern. They are lateralized to one hemisphere. They are highly correlated to seizures if their frequency increases more than two hertz and if they are in association with plus features. The outcome with this, the mortality rate is still very low. However, it does cause severe disability and uh, vegetative state in patients. So there are some examples of EG, which I'm gonna show you, which shows lateralized periodic discharges. Here is 
left-sided, 0.5 to 1 hertz. This is spike and wave, but here we are defining them as discharges because of the inter-discharge interval. They are not happening in clusters, so we are not going to classify them as spike and wave. So these are spike, spike and wave lateralized periodic discharges on the left side. Another example here, maximal on the right with some spread on the left. Again, left-sided. These LPDs are with faster frequencies. So here they will be classified as LPDs plus F. Now this category of LPDs are called unilateral independent periodic discharges. Now if you look at this image, you will see that there are discharges on the left side, one to 1.5 hertz, and there are independent discharges at the midline. They are still considered unilateral. If you are seeing discharges on one hemisphere and in the central, the central one is to be considered on the side you are seeing LPDs. So we are not going to call them generalized. We're not going to call them anything else. These are unilateral, but they are independent. Now, these central discharges can happen in, in accordance with the one on the left side, but here they are not. They are unilaterally independent. Here is another example. GPDs, generalized periodic discharges. These discharges are seen in less than 5% of the critically ill patients. And they have uniform morphology, both hemispheres, and there is definitely an inter-discharge interval between them. These discharges are, most of the time, are because of toxic metabolic encephalopathy. So these are basically metabolic occurrences can have, can, can make EGs having these generalized discharges. These discharges, many occasions, are associated with uh, non-convulsive seizures and non-convulsive status epilepticus. The outcome is somewhat controversial, but how, however, they are not a marker of poor prognosis. Here are some examples of the generalized periodic discharges, frontally predominant one hertz GPDs. Another frontally predominant sharps and spikes with attenuated background. These are triphasic morphology. Triphasics are GPDs. Even if they are just frontally predominant, they are still considered as GPDs. Multifocal GPDs, it's just like we are seeing multifocal spikes in neonates. Adults can also show multifocal GPDs. However, these GPDs are seen very rarely in patients with the uh, with multiple focal lesions or deeper brain infarcts. This is quite a rare thing. If somebody's having GPDs, multifocal GPDs is quite a rare occurrence. Here is another example of multifocal periodic discharges. They are three different kinds of discharges in one brain. On the left side, there are blunted periodic discharges with attenuated background. Then there are sharps, at the right frontal and spiky ones with faster frequencies at P4. So there are three independent uh, periodic discharges happening in this EG. Now another poll question here, GPDs with triphasic morphology, are they ictal? So what is your take on it? Triphasic morphology, they are GPDs, are they ictal? So you can answer now. Is it possible, Jeff, to see the response? I mean, for this will be easy, but uh, this is just yes or no. Otherwise, if there are multiple choices, do you think we can see that on the screen? I will see. <laughs> I 
It may be that you need to pause the slideshow. Oh, okay. Pop it up. Let's try that. I'll give you just a few more seconds here to answer the poll question. And I'm going to end it now. We have 36% say yes, 63% say no. So triphasic morphology is basically what we think about is usually metabolic encephalopathy. It could be, could be kidneys, could be liver. Now, when these triphasic morphology go up to two, 2.5 hertz, there is a high probability that they are going to become ictal. Then you have sharpish morphology of triphasic waves, and then you have roundish. Now, if the patient who is lethargic is having 2 hertz of 2.5 hertz of triphasics are being treated, and you see disappearance of triphasics, but the clinically patient is not improved, it's pure metabolic encephalopathy. If both the triphasics and the clinical state of the patient improves, they were ictal. So yes, GP triphasics can be both ictal as well as non-ictal, but it will be hard to figure out until they get treated and you see the clinical state of the patient. Bilateral independent periodic discharges. These are also very rarely seen, bilateral independent. However, they are right behind LPDs in causing the damage they can cause. So they occur independently on both hemispheres asynchronously. They are because of diffuse cerebral injury. And they have moderate to high risk, almost 80% of the patients having bipedes are going to have seizures. And of course, they have, are associated with poor outcomes. So like I said, they are right behind LPDs in causing the damage. And for you that to, to make your mind, if you're monitoring that, okay, this patient is having bipedes, there's a high chance that patient is going to seize. Some of the examples on the EEG, here you see left and right, it's very faint, but you can still figure out on the top is left and right and left and right. So these are bilateral independent periodic discharges, 0.5 hertz, and they are occurring asynchronously in both the hemispheres. Another example here, the arrows on the left and these stars on the right side. They are of different frequencies. Again, another image, another example of these independent discharges on left and right side. Stimulus induced. We all mark our EEGs, whether it is reactive or not. Anytime you have a comatose intubated patient, the staff comes in, messes with the patient, uh, and you see some sort of a change in the EEG. That change can be in any form. It can be periodic, rhythmic, and it even can be ictal appearing. But here is a thing to keep in mind about the stimulus induced. They are uh, self-limiting. So once the patient is not bothered, patient is left alone, they disappear. If not, these stimulus induced rhythmic discharges can evolve into a full-fledged non-convulsive status epilepticus. So the outcome of the patient depends on what pattern are we going to see and if it is getting evolved or not. So they can be generalized rhythmic delta, LPDs, GPDs, bipedes, spike wave, polyspike wave, and even triphasic morphology. So here is another question. We all talk about stimulus induced. While you are monitoring or have in a, in a clinical setting, have you ever noticed stimulus terminated or attenuated pattern.
and the pole is up. Navita, I think if you click over and look at polls, you might be able to see the same thing I'm seeing. Okay. And we'll wrap it up here in just a second. <laughs> I'm ending the poll. Results. I am not aware of such a thing. 29%. Yes, 32%. And no, 37%. So everybody is sort of equally divided onto this. These patterns do appear. Definitely you have seen it. It's like if the patient is having LPDs or LRDA and the staff comes in and cleans the patient or maybe suction the patient. Those patterns sort of get attenuated. You will see maybe low voltage delta theta. So when you're seeing that, it's a good thing. Abnormal pattern disappearing or maybe some sort of another pattern appears which is not, not an abnormal one. So that is like, for example, somebody's having triphasics. With suction, the triphasics go away because there is an arousal. That is a good thing. The prognosis is good in such patients. This is kind of a reactivity. So stimulus induced as well as stimulus terminated patterns in ICU EGs are common. And if you see any change that the abnormal pattern is kind of disappearing, the prognosis will be better, will be good for that very patient. Here are some of the EGs of stimulus-induced rhythmic periodic discharges. If you see it here, this patient with left hemicraniectomy, you can still you can see some breach rhythm in the left frontal channels. Uh, and with the stimulation, so the slide B, EEG pattern B is after the stimulation, 30 seconds after the first one was taken. Now where there was breach, you see the spike in wave discharges there. And there is rhythmic delta on the right side. So a patient who is peaceful and calm with some breach rhythms is starting to have abnormal pattern with stimulus. This should go away by itself, or it may get evolved into a full-fledged seizure. Next here, this is a baseline. Uh, you see some faster activities, attenuated background, and here the patient was given sternal rub. As soon as the sternal rub is given, <clears throat> so up here, it's just the previous slide. I have put the previous slide for you to compare it with. With the sternal rub, there are one hertz GPDs and some faster frequencies here. So let's see what happens next. And this pattern kind of continues for over 20 seconds. The next slide shows all these three slides put together. This is stimulus-induced GPDs. That's what you're going to call them, stimulus-induced GPDs. When a patient with anoxic brain injury and sternal rub is causing this pattern here. Another example here. This is before stimulation. As soon as the staff enters the room, the stimulation is causing uh, periodic lateralized epileptiform discharges, which are maximal on the C4. And there is rhythmic delta. And like I said before, it, it looks like this pattern is sort of disappearing in the last three seconds. So this is self-limiting stimulus-induced uh, lateralized periodic discharges on the right side. Another example here. Uh, and this, this is a patient with subarachnoid sub hemorrhage and someone is at the bedside, is causing this ectal appearing discharges in the left side. 
So for some, some neurologists, some epileptologists, this is a seizure. So it is, if it is lasting for more than 10 seconds, it is going to be, uh, be categorized as seizure. Another example here, uh, stimulus-induced pattern. It's about 1, 1.5 hertz with underlying rhythmic delta activity. Uh, there is an evolution in frequency, amplitude, morphology, and of course, location also. So this is quite an evolving pattern. So every time you see this, uh, this P has should be capital. Uh, when you are describing stimulus-induced patterns, it can be stimulus-induced RDA. Stimulus-induced periodic discharges can be LRDA or it can be uh, GPDs. Uh, st spike and wave, interictal continuum. It could be birds. The stimulus can induce in birds and patients and, of course, seizures. Let's talk about birds. Birds are brief uh, ictal rhythmic discharges. We come across this most of the time when we when we monitor neonates. So here is a question for you. What do you think about birds? They appear for less than 10 seconds. They're seeing in neonates. They are associated with prevalence of seizures in critically ill patients. You think these all statements are correct or they are incorrect? And the poll is up. And it looks like people are changing their minds. Mm -hmm. Because this is quite a changing pattern, that's why. <laughs> Give you about five more seconds here. <clears throat> And we'll end the poll. So answers appear for less than 10 seconds, 18%. Seen in neonates extensively, 7%. Associated with high prevalence of seizures in critically ill adults, 10%. All these statements are correct, 60%. All are incorrect, 2%. Okay, it's a sad news for 2% people. 60% yes, all these statements are correct. Birds were not recognized in adult population for quite some time, for a very long time. They were being called sporadic discharges, intermittent discharges and things like that. They were not recognized. They were pattern of neonates, especially with, the, with cerebral injury. In, in neonates, okay? And uh, pretty recently, I think 2010, 2013, the article was published in 2014. Uh, around about 2010 or so, they started to talk about these birds in, in, in adult population. Now, if you see birds in critically ill patients, they are highly associative of seizures. But these brief, Ectal rhythmic discharges are even seen in patients who are walking and talking, having history of epilepsy. There is over 50% prevalence of those people developing refractory epilepsy. So 90% 90, 90 of ICU patients are going to have seizures if you see birds. Where those seizures are going to be? Exactly the same location where birds are. These birds can be theta, alpha, or beta activity. Anything above four hertz, they just appear and then they sort of disappear. They do cause neurodevelopmental delays and damages in neonates. 
it is still unclear in adults, but yes, we are knowing more and more. There is only one paper that is talking about 90% of ICU patients are going to have seizures and 50% of walking, talking, non-critical patients will have refractory epilepsy. So we are getting somewhere with this pattern in adults. Here are the examples. And uh, these are mix of, uh, this is actually all adult patients. The article that is, I'm getting this one is all adult patients showing uh, uh, independent, sorry, ectal rhythmic discharges, brief. So brief in the sense they're happening less than 10 seconds. Ideally speaking, we should be categorize them as very brief. So somewhere between one to 10 seconds, one to, one to less than 10 seconds, these discharges will be there in any frequency, any pattern. Another example here, these are three little birds here on a attenuated or suppressed background at the posterior quadrant. Here is another example. There is evolution for three seconds and then the patient goes back to attenuated background. Another example here, the middle of the page, this is alpha beta frequencies. These are birds happening here. Here, here is an example. So there are epilepsy form discharges and birds for two seconds. And the seizure, there is an evolution of birds at the same location where birds were. So this is a full flush seizure at, at the uh, front toes, on, sorry, on the left side. Uh, we do talk about uh, uh, proxysmal fast activity or generalized PFA or PFA, that is also the talk is will be getting categorized as as birds. Patients with birds also have LPDs, but these two patterns are completely independent of each other. They are not associated with each other. They are not happening because one is present. There is absolutely no association if you see LPDs and birds in in one patient in one EED. The biggest difference between these is that the LPDs are periodic and birds are sporadic. They come and they go. LPDs are going to last for days. Birds, however, are very brief and they sort of disappear once the seizures are under control. LPDs tend to persist. Even if the patient is getting discharged from the hospital, will be still showing some sort of LPDs. So LPDs will persist even after the seizures are controlled, but the birds sort of seats. And they both are independently associated uh, with higher risk of seizures. <laughs> Rhythmic delta activity. So it can be generalized, it can be lateralized. So the old names we are still so accustomed to using it is Farda, Warda, and Terda. According to new terminology, the GRDA is to be called as frontally predominant GRDA or temporally predominant or occipitally predominant GRDA. So it is less than four hertz, less than or equal to four hertz of delta uniform morphology. So this is different from polyphasic delta. So do not get confused with polyphasic delta and rhythmic delta activity. This pattern is usually seen in patients with wide variety of cerebral lesions and metabolic disturbances. So this is basically a metabolic derangement. We see uh, the, uh, it's not associated with poor outcome. Here is another question for you all. What is the most benign pattern of the ectal interectal zone? And the poll is published. So we are talking about the benign pattern here.
And the answers are going to be locked in here in about five seconds. And I'll end the poll. And the results are Lerda's 18%, General 54%, Birds 21%, and GPDs 5%. The most innocent pattern in ICU EEG is GRDA. So 54% of the people are right. Now, LRDA shares the same stage as LPDs are. LRDA in association with uh, modifiers is as dangerous as LPDs are. So if you see lateralized rhythmic delta activity with fast frequencies or with sharps, that is going to evolve into seizure at some point. GRDA is the most innocent pattern. That is one pattern. If you see an ICU patient, if there are no sharps, no spikes hiding in there, embedded in there, you can take a breath, with, at least with that EG. So 54% of the people were correct about GRDA. So here is generalized rhythmic delta activity. There, some people will say there are some sharps embedded in it and somebody will not call it. So it is, it is a slight stimulus here which has induced some sharp activity or spike activity. This is generalized rhythmic delta activity in an ICU patient. Another example is stimulus induced. So here the patient has diffuse delta theta, some fast frequencies here and with the suctioning there is generalized rhythmic delta activity, 1.5 hertz. Another example, this is lateralized rhythmic delta with some sharps and spikes hiding in it. This is another example of lateralized uh, rhythmic delta activity. If I would call there are some faster frequencies here. This is LRDA with plus modifier that is sharps and spikes. This here is unilateral independent LRDA <coughs> with fast frequencies. So if you see the right hemisphere has two different kinds of lateralized rhythmic delta happening here. The frontocentral is showing 1.5 and the frontotemporal is showing one hertz of lateralized rhythmic delta overriding faster frequencies. Let's talk spike and wave, sharp and wave. Now, we can call them spike and wave complexes, sharp and wave complexes, and they are also categorized as periodic discharges. When they are, when there is no uh, inter-discharge interval, they are simply spike wave, spike wave, spike wave. So they're spike and wave discharge, spike and wave pattern or complexes. But when you see an inter-discharge interval between spike and wave, they are to be categorized as periodic discharges. And we can never miss spike and wave in an EEG. Here are some of the examples. This is poorly formed. There is a very tiny spike here, almost 2.53 hertz. Here, another example of three hertz and a perfect generalized epilepsy patient with photic three hertz spike and wave discharge, spike and wave complexes, not discharges. Now, all these patterns that we see in ICU, they, they either evolve, they sort of disappear or they fluctuate. So when we are describing EEG, we are talking in terms of the frequency of the pattern, the morphology, where is it located, what is the amplitude? So with, with that said, what do you think that out of all these four uh, things that we talk about, uh, frequency, morphology, location, which is not, which will not qualify as evolving or fluctuating?
and we'll give you five more seconds. And I'll end the poll. So we have change in frequency, 17%, change in morphology, 8%, change in location, 47%, and change in voltage, 26%. Okay, so if there is change in voltage or amplitude of a given pattern, it is not evolving or fluctuating. Change in frequencies, the pattern is evolving in frequency. That's how seizures are. Morphology, from rhythmic delta, it becomes spike and wave. That is an evolution. And if it is going from one hemisphere to another hemisphere or from front to back, that is an evolving pattern. However, change in voltage is not considered evolving or fluctuating. So three things, frequency, morphology, location. So uh, what I say is uh, time and space uh, and the looks. These are the three things that are the most important things when you are describing an EEG, how the EEG looks, okay? Uh, that is the morphology. Is it changing? The frequency, is it changing in frequency from delta? Is it becoming fast activity or is it becoming spike and wave or there is uh, rhythmicity in it? Location, is it going from anterior to posterior? Is it spreading to another hemisphere? So those three are the one that will be considered any change in frequency morphology location is considered evolving or fluctuating. However, voltage does not go in that category. So these are some of the sources. ACNS is a free website. You can download the new terminology and the EG uh, pictures on that. Uh, and that will help you to, to get more into understanding and naming these patterns using the terminology. And uh, any questions, I will take them now. I will note that uh, some of these articles have been shared now, so you can download those from the uh, webinar site. And if you have questions, please enter them into the chat area uh, right now. Well, I haven't seen any questions come no in questions. the chat area. Uh, so I will uh, state that if there are any uh, questions that come up later, you definitely can uh, go directly to Navita for uh, the answer and definitely mine her deep well of knowledge in this regard. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, appreciate it. And uh, that is all. We'll end it now. And thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jeff. Have a good night. Goodbye.